Now, um, I would like to continue with um, the presentation from my colleague Sandra Kengma. Sandra, she is a um, PhD student in our institute and is uh, one of the backbones of our uh, uh, work packet six uh, since um, you've done uh, so much for that and actually you will give uh, several presentations of your work during uh, those two days. And first, uh, I'll give you the floor on the literature review you've done. All right, so my name is Sandra Kamga, as I introduced myself earlier. Um, I'm working within the RVM as part of work package six and uh, Today and tomorrow, I'll be presenting a couple of our work that we've done uh, the last three to four years. So, yeah, once again, welcome. Uh, I hope you really enjoy this workshop and then you get some insights so that you can uh, think of concrete measures that can be implemented in your country after you leave here. Before I start, I actually really want to thank a couple of people who really helped uh, not only organize the workshop, but also have been helping during the last three to four years and uh, making... Yeah, actually making work package six possible. Of course, we have uh, our uh, organizers here in Latvia that who have really helped us, but also work package two have helped us immensely with um, yeah promoting our workshop, but also writing some of the things that we've uh, disseminated. So once again, thank you thank very very much work package two um, from from the UK, but also from Finland, and of course work package one who have always supported our activities. I hope that um, our results will help with the final report at the end. And the presenters, thank you so much for being here today, giving insights from your countries so that we can put the Work Package 6 work into perspective. Um, I hope that you also will gain some insights for your own countries. And um, yeah, my Work Package 6 team, also those who are not here today, such as student assistants that have contributed a lot to some of the results that I'll be presenting today. So. Now I'll be presenting a systematic review that we wrote, uh, which, was, which was aiming to identify the sectors involved in European public health emergency and response. Um, so there are, as Karine said, documents such as the international health regulations that has been updated, of course, and the decision 1082 that call for multisexual collaboration. But it's, in my opinion, not very clear what that means. What is multisexual collaboration? which sectors must collaborate, and when should they collaborate. There's also governance literature that also states that for good governance, governments need to consider a more all, a whole society approach. They need to consider other aspects of the society who can provide insights and expertise to make effective policy making. Uh, but once again, in the context of public health emergencies, what does that really mean? Again, what is most sexual collaboration? Which sectors are involved and when should they be involved? The first question is a little bit difficult to answer, uh, but the last two we aim to answer with our systematic review. Uh, so what we did is we looked into the literature, the existing literature on um, public health emergencies to find out what have those who have published peer-reviewed articles, what have they described when they are uh, writing about public health emergencies that took place? Which sectors have they described? and how, how did the collaboration look like, or when did the collaboration take place? So what we did, we conducted a search strategy in Scopus and uh, Embase, where we looked for articles that have been peer-reviewed that really describe public health emergencies that took place uh, between 2005 and 2020. We chose 2005 because it's the year that the international health regulation was implemented. So we thought if there would be a change in how multisexual collaboration was described, or at least how public health emergency were described, it would be from that year on. And 2020 was, yeah, at the start of the COVID-19 pandemic uh, when we decided to do this research. We used um, specific terms, specific mesh terms that related to four key concepts, multisexual collaboration, public health emergency, preparedness, and response. So we really specifically looked at peer-reviewed articles and we identified 4,047 articles. So Betty and I screened all these articles, of course, first title and abstract, and then the whole article. And yeah, at the end of the process, we had 94 articles that we included in our literature review. So included articles really focused on preparedness and or response to public health emergencies. And because we wanted to keep the all hazard approach, we not only looked at infectious diseases, but we also looked in general at biological outbreaks, chemical outbreaks, radionuclear outbreaks, and 
environmental problems. So it was quite broad, hoping that we would capture as many sectors as possible. It's important that we also looked at articles that focus on public health emergencies that actually affected human health. So that had an impact in terms of mortality or morbidity. And we focus on the European continent. What did we do that from that on? We proceeded by identifying organizations that were mentioned in these articles. Um, so yeah, organization is quite a broad term. So anytime an organization was mentioned, we'd identify it. And then we try to group them uh, into sectors based on the, um, the European Commission's list of sectors and economic activities that we had amended to make it specific for our purpose. We then focused on passages that describe multisectoral collaboration or actually collaboration in general. And it could be that the authors described it as coordination, any word that kind of showed that specific people were working together in some way or another. And we also looked then specifically how often specific organizations, which were then grouped into sectors, were mentioned in those ways. So we had a total of 28 possible sectors and that could be identified. But as you can see on the PowerPoint presentation, there were actually four, only four sectors that were mentioned uh, more than 5% of the time. And so we look at the total amount that specific sectors were mentioned, only four were mentioned more than 5%, 5 or more of the time. We have the governmental institutions, human health industries, experts, and civil society. While it's not very surprising that governmental institutions were mentioned so often because at the end of the day, it's the government that is responsible for dealing with public health emergencies. I think in most countries, or at least so it's, as it is stated in the IHR, ultimately the government must take care of preparedness and response. So I think it's also logical that they were mentioned quite often. We're also not very surprised that the human health industry was mentioned quite often as we focused on public health emergencies where human health was affected. And so it would be strange if they were not involved at all. I think what was a little bit more interesting is Experts, and here experts we defined as anyone who had knowledge regarding the origin of the public health emergency. So, for example, if it was a public health emergency of radio, radionuclear origin, then there would be someone who had specific knowledge uh, on how that would work and how to combat it. But we also included people who had specific knowledge on crisis management or preparedness and response. So it could be that the... Um, that they could provide insights on how to deal with a crisis in general, even though they did not know specific, they did not have the specific specifics of the origin. Uh, we must say that when we look into the literature, it has been described that it is difficult for a crisis to be managed if the specifics of the crisis is, not, is unknown or the information is lacking. So where do you get this information from? The experts that have studied or who have experience in this uh, field. And then perhaps my favorite sector that was mentioned is a civil society. Civil society is, of course, a very broad sector. And it included the average citizen, but it also included religious groups. It, could, it included anyone outside of the specific sectors that we had named that could play a role uh, as an individual or as an organization in policymaking. And I think that is very interesting because in a democratic society that most, I think, if not all European countries work with, um, there has been a general shift to the idea that in good governance, one rec the government requires more collaboration. The government requires to not only serve the citizens, but also to engage the citizens. And in that case, I think it's interesting that this was then also mentioned. What I'd like to also share is that we not only looked at which sectors were mentioned as taking part in preparedness and response. We also looked at which sectors were, um, which sectors were stated that should be part of preparedness and response. And when you look at that difference, this, uh, uh, this slide is actually for the sectors that, um, and when we consider both of them, but when you split it up, civil society was hardly mentioned in actually taking place, but it was more often mentioned as it should take place in the future. So it is obviously something that we, I think, as people involved in preparedness and response should really consider. Then there's a, a preparedness and response cycle that Corinne has already showed you, um, where there are seven domains of public health preparedness and response. 
And we wanted to look at in which domains um, are the sectors mentioned as taking part of collaboration. Uh, it could be that some of you are already familiar with it as part of the HEPSA tool. So they're the pre-event event, and post-event aspects, which have been further split up into government, capacity building and main, maintenance, surveillance, risk assessment, risk and crisis management, post-event evaluation and implementation of lessons learned. So keeping this in mind, I want to show you the next heat map. It is more importantly to look at the colors than the specifics of it. So on the right-hand side, there are the sectors that were mentioned, but in the columns, you have the different domains of the preparedness and response cycle. And so what we showed is that there are actually a couple of domains that are hardly ever mentioned when looking at uh, collaboration. So for example, you see risk and crisis management, and in the top uh, sector is governmental institutions. The governmental institutions are mo mentioned very often as collaborating with another sector with the risk and crisis management, during risk and crisis management. But if you look at lessons learned, for example, it's practically all red. That means there were no mentions of any collaborations with those sectors when looking at lessons learned. Similar to capacity building and maintenance, post-event evaluation is a little bit better, but apparently in the articles that we surveyed, or that we um, looked at, there's hardly any mention of collaboration in those specific domains. What does that mean? Does that mean that it's not necessary, or does that mean that it just doesn't take place? Well, previous research does suggest that preparedness and response requires collaboration in its entirety. So not only specific aspects of preparedness and response. Um, our hypothesis based also on other research is that the, the first couple of domains, so risk and crisis management, pre-event preparation of governments, perhaps they're more urgent aspects. For example, lessons learned tend to take place in more peacetime, perhaps we can say, situations where the urgency is not as strong, where pe perhaps people are thinking we can do it from our desk without having the need to collaborate with others. It's a hypothesis, we don't know. I think it's something that needs to be investigated, but I do think it does show that not only are specific sectors dominating collaboration, but they're also dominating collaboration during specific aspects of the preparedness and response uh, cycle. We do wonder if the collaboration with other sectors in, for example, post-event evaluation will not improve the efficacy and efficiency of risk and crisis management. I tend to think so, but I think it's something that needs more consideration. One thing that we did see during this research, like I said in the beginning, it's difficult to say what is multisexual collaboration. So we have looked at the literature which has shown sectors that are actually dominating the literature in terms of multisexual collaboration. We've seen certain domains that are mentioned often, but it's still hard to conceptualize exactly what is multisexual collaboration. What does it mean exactly? And how can we operationalize it? So I, that is something that we try to look at during the rest of the work package six activities, but it is also something that I hope at, that at the end of this workshop, that for yourself, you will have a little bit of a better idea of what does multisexual collaboration mean in your country? Because I think that's also an aspect that needs consideration that national differences can affect the definition of multisexual collaboration. So that's a short overview of our literature review that we did. Are there any questions? Yeah, before we go to the break, are there any questions uh, regarding the literature study? Yes, please. Uh, just a question, it's a bit of a basic question, but uh, when you do the literature review, uh, on the term multisectoral, oftentimes there's a term intersex ecology. Do you use it synonymously, or uh, how, how do you think of this? It's a different concept, but it's a link. Uh, how do you between that in your working? Yeah, that's very true. We decided to just incorporate all possible synonyms or possible concept that related to some sort of collaboration. So uh, in the, 
when we wrote about it, we talked of most sexual collaboration, but there's, of course, intersexual collaboration. When we looked at passages describing collaboration, we also looked at coordination, cooperation. Um, for example, even data sharing, showing something that people are working together to reach a specific solution. So the, I, the concept of most sexual collaboration was broad during this um, literature review. But for the future, I think it would be good to specify which cases is coordination better than cooperation, for example. Um, yeah, that's something to be looked at. Okay, yeah. yes, another question. Uh, excellent work, Sandra. Thank you for sharing your presence with us. Uh, I just wanted to check whether uh, you were able to look at, I don't know if it was one of the questions you were looking at, whether these countries had a legislative basis that mandates intersectoral collaboration uh, and whether that made a difference or not. Yeah, uh, that would be very interesting to look at indeed. We did not look at specific countries um, or we did not code it according to specific countries. Perhaps uh, there's also a specific bias that we have English literature, like English language literature. So I think we do not have a right spread of the literature from all European countries. Um, one of the things that is also difficult, this is peer-reviewed literature, but to, it would be, of course, very interesting to look at more uh, national evaluations, for example, that, that really states what ha was done in the country, but that is a little bit difficult <laughs> to have access to, um, especially if you don't speak all the languages uh, in the European Union. But that is something that would be very interesting to look at at a really more practical perspective what could be improved, what has been said that could be improved, rather than just what has been published as peer-reviewed. Yeah. Last question before the break. Yes, Karen. That, I mean, work package by we were looking at um, uh, collaborations uh, across member uh, states, and it's undertaken a survey um, just recently, in the last couple of months, I believe it's been mm -hmm. If anybody's interested, just come to me and I'll um, give you the link. But there might be some detail on that, like, that exact question, whether there were people in legislative infrastructures that prompted a particular country to collaborate and cause this new cross border threat space. So I think that those of us that, so there'll be changes coming down the road. And we'll be looking at your current. Yeah, no, no problem. I think in later uh, today, I'll give a presentation when we also looked at what national focal points have said about the sectors that collaborated during COVID-19. So perhaps we will have a little bit more information. This is in a cliffhanger. Uh, thank you, uh, Sandra.